everyone. Welcome to the Ohio Art Council Life Gallery. My name is Amy Wisman. I am the Marketing and Exhibitions Fellow here. And it's my pleasure to introduce you to our latest exhibition, Paper Up, Women to Watch, 2020 Ohio. Um, this exhibition is a collaboration between the Ohio Advisory Group to the National Museum of, of Women in the Arts and the Ohio Arts Council. And I'm really, really pleased to be introducing Natalie Lanise, who is not only an inspiration as a woman artist, but specifically as an artist that teaches music. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Um, it's a pleasure to be here in Columbus this evening. And um, thank you to everyone who's watching. Um, I'll just go ahead and get started. Um, I'm starting my presentation with um, an image of a piece that I'm exhibiting in this show. It's titled Dismantle and uh, was created uh, here on site just a few weeks ago. And I wanted to start with this image because um, it is my newest work and I think it incorporates some um, elements that I've been working with in my work um, for the last 15 years. And so there's, um, as I, go through my talk and some uh, work I've made over the years, I think you'll see some um, similarities and notice how the work has evolved over time. Um, but there's, there's things that have really stayed true um, over all those years. So um, one of those things is um, that I would describe this piece as a paint and collage installation. That's a description I use pretty frequently with my work, um, mostly because it's um, you know there's it's pretty clear what the work is. Um, it helps the viewer understand what they're looking at. Um, but I do want to point out that I'm trained as a painter, and I think of my work from the standpoint of painting. So um, in in all of these pieces that you're about to see, there's a thought process behind them where I'm I'm approaching it from um, a, a painter's standpoint and maybe playfully um, subverting or tinkering with the process of painting um, through the process of collage. Um, the other thing you'll notice about this piece is that it is a collage. Um, the enlarged cutout of the hand is collaged directly onto the wall, as is the um, lower painting on paper. The background of this painting is painted directly onto the wall. So that's, that's where I see the installation part come in. Um, collage has, uh, since I kind of started taking it seriously as a process and as an art form, um, it has really become my um, mode of sort of building a painting. Um, it enables me to kind of work modularly and have different pieces and parts um, in my hands that I can put together and, um, and assemble like into a composition. So that's just been um, a, a kind of tactile process that's really resonated with me over the years and um, a, a way I've really grown comfortable working. Um, finally, this piece just ever so slightly kind of dips into three-dimensional space. And that's something that I've been working with a little more recently. Um, for, for quite some time, these collages were pretty strictly two-dimensional. And over the last, um, several years I've really started to incorporate um, either the architecture of the space or sculptural elements or um, dimension in some physical sense. Um, one of the things about working with collage that excites me is that the, um, the, like the photographic image for instance implies an illusion of depth um, on a picture plane where I've painted like a you know, a pretty slick, like flat pattern. Um, it kind of reinforces its flatness and then interrupted that with, um, with an image or in some cases objects that, um, that kind of push up against that in some way. So, um, so I think this piece, you know, kind of incorporates a lot of these things I've been thinking about for many years. Um, so in that way, it's a, it's a great introduction for what um, I'll talk about this evening. And, um, we can get back to this one at the end. If uh, anyone has questions about the work that's in this show, I'd be happy to talk about it a little bit more. Um, just as some 
introductory um, kind of biographical <laughs> info for you to get started. Um, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. I spent quite a bit of time as a young person at the Cleveland Museum of Art. And um, I always start my artist talk with a couple of images from Cleveland's collection that um, I recall having experiences with as a kid and um, which like looking back at over the years have sort of learned from in like how maybe this um, like formative experience uh, shaped the way that I have thought about my work since then. So um, the first among those pieces is Andy Warhol's Maryland Times 100. Um, as a youngster, you can, you know, you can see why this would be appealing to a kid. Um, you know, repetition, the iconic imagery, um, his use of candy colors, the, you know, all the stuff of pop art that um, is accessible and um, appealing kind of to the masses. Um, yet, you know, I've studied Warhol over different periods of my career and there's, you know, so many other aspects of his his artwork and his persona that have resonated with me at different points in time. Um, so, so like such as like the rep, you know, deterioration of the image through repetition and um, you know, what that, what that means as a commentary on our culture. Um, all of those things that he was working with in his work, um, you know, were appealing to me when I was little and, <laughs> you know, equally appealing as a graduate student. Um, I should also note the scale of this piece. I think each of the portraits is at or just a bit larger than life size. So that gives you a sense of the scale here. Um, there's, you know, especially to like a, you know, to a child, this piece really confronts you. And I think there was something really powerful in the scale of the work as well. The other artwork in Cleveland's collection that couldn't be any more different <laughs> is this piece, um, Lot's Wife by Anselm Kiefer. And um, the museum, I think, acquired this uh, piece around 1990. So I would have been 10 years old when I first saw it. And I, I remember having a very emotional response to this work. And I remember sitting in the gallery and spending time with it and responding to um, you know, the, the heavy physicality of the surface, uh, responding to the landscape, responding to um, the mood of the piece. And I think probably having some sense of what it was about, um, but certainly not, you know, a, a deep understanding of it. And so, um, again, the scale of this piece is, it's massive. It's two lead panels. I think it weighs like two tons or something like that. Um, so it, it really has uh, physically a heavy presence and of course, emotionally a heavy presence as well. And um, that's, um, that's, again, another piece that uh, I've really studied and, um, you know, loved over the years. So um, after, um, I, so I grew up in Cleveland. I attended a high school with a really excellent art program. So I knew from a pretty young age that art was something that I wanted to do. Um, I attended Xavier University in Cincinnati, Ohio, and studied art and education there. And then after um, undergrad, I moved back to Cleveland for a couple of years. I studied at Case Western Reserve University and the Cleveland Institute of Art and, um, you know, studied some education in art history at Case and took studio classes at CIA. And that's, that's really where this um, love of painting and then especially collage uh, happened. Um, I started making collages in a a uh, couple of painting classes that I took at CIA. And until that point, I um, I never really took it seriously. Like it was the kind of thing I did like to make birthday cards for friends or <laughs> like as like a fun hobby. Um, and it, it hadn't really occurred to me that it could function as a, um, you know, as a formal artwork. Um, so in 2005, I made a collage um, that was uh, pasted to a painted panel. So it had the physical presence um, on the wall like of a painting and um, it, we discussed it in a critique like using like a you know like the conversation of painting 
And um, this was like a major breakthrough for me because I finally found um, the material um, that was enabling me to say what I wanted to say. Um, it was um, opening up an opportunity to be humorous. It was um, allowing me to be a little tongue in cheek with, um, with my subject. It, um, it was just a whole lot of fun too. Like it, I, like up until that point, I thought this was like such a serious endeavor. And then like, uh, and then I like figured out it could be really fun on top of that. <laughs> and so um, collages is, is kind of where I made all these discoveries. So um, that year I had also applied to um, MFA programs. And uh, in 2005, I moved to Brooklyn and um, began graduate school at Pratt Institute. And so this is work that I was like, after I made that first collage, I like really hit the ground running with it that summer and like got to New York and um, just started making these like crazy. So um, what you're looking at is, um, it's a pretty substantial piece. It's on panel. It's about 24 inches on the long side, just to give you a sense of scale. And um, the background is a, um, like appropriate appropriated vintage wallpaper pattern that I uh, made a woodcut of so I could like print many many copies of that and different colors and so forth and like produce a lot of collage material um, to create the grounds for these collages. Um, I was also combining acrylic paint and then you know just collecting so many images from my collection of old magazines. Um, I was having a lot of fun like liberating these women from like underwear ads and um, advertisements where they were like cuddling up with their kitchen appliances and like putting them in um, other domestic situations where maybe they had a little more agency and a little more independence. Um, so there was, there was sort of constant joy in like taking apart these contexts and then retelling um, my own stories with those images. So this is a similar sized piece um, that I made around that same time, around 2005. Um, back to some influences. Uh, now that I was kind of really digging my teeth into collage, I was looking to Dada artists quite a bit. Um, Hannah Hawk um, being a standout among that group as um, probably the most well-known woman Dada artist. And um, I think the things about this movement that really resonated with me were, um, you know, kind of a, a rebellion that was happening against um, maybe more conventional, uh, like, materials that were being used. So Dada artists were using, um, you know, newspaper clippings and, um, you know, text and um, ephemera. Um, that probably at the time would have been kind of frowned upon as um, from people, appreciators of high art. Um, they also just like the work was nonsense and they, and that's what, that's what the group wanted it to be. And so, um, you know, there was definitely some absurdity in it. And those are all things that I like really, really appreciate <laughs> about this work and, um, and considered in my own work as well. In addition um, to looking at other artists and art history, um, popular culture and film and television were equally influential on my work. Um, I, if you think of those last two collages that I showed you, I was um, working on these like kind of domestic interiors and really thinking about them as building little sets in which I could tell a story. And so um, thinking of thinking of them as a film set or a TV set, for instance, um, you know, had me looking at uh, movies and TV in a kind of a different way. Um, David Lynch, and this is a scene from Twin Peaks, um, you know, has an excellent knack for um, very humorous prop placement in many scenes. That's something that I really love about him, as well as if we're going to talk about absurdity, um, of course, something that he does so well. Um, so I was like Tim Burton's, you know, pastel, identical, like, you know, perfect suburb as such a 
contrast to Edward Scissorhands. Um, these are, you know, such iconic things that um, were part of like my visual world that, um, you know, we're, we're saying the kinds of things that I wanted to say. So, um, so popular culture has always, you know, had um, as much of an influence on what I'm looking at and what I'm thinking about as, um, you know, art historical references as well. Um, so in my second year of graduate school, or maybe it was my second semester, I um, was really loving this process that I had developed, but um, I, I was a little worried about like pinholing myself into like this retro like vintage palette and, um, and kind of ni like niche a little too much. And so I, I wanted to keep some things in place and then impose some limitations on myself to see what I could like really learn about what I was doing. So um, you can see that the woodcut pattern is still playing a role here, but instead of carving out these intricate wallpaper patterns, I just like went super simple and just cut this zigzag. And that's kind of when using the zigzag pattern started for me. Um, I also limited the palette. So I only allowed myself to use red, white, and black in these pieces. And then another big limitation with collage and using the imagery directly out of these magazines is um, oftentimes like figures would be cut off, like off the edge of a page or just the edge of the ad. And it, um, you know, it was somewhat problematic to like find a, a figure in its entirety, like with its feet or, you know, with full pants or, or whatever. And so, um, I needed to be just like a little less of a perfectionist about those things and like allow myself to loosen up and see if, you know, if part of that image is gone, do, does this still work? And what it did was um, force me to look a lot more formally at what I was doing. So consider line and shape um, and texture and, you know, compose my pieces based on those things and then um, you know let go of that narrative or let go of that subject um, mattered like just or at least let go of tight grip I had on it and, and see what happens um, and I really loved the result um, the the idea of um, you know a, a figure being incomplete being truncated um, is really based in like a, a pretty simple painting and drawing lesson. And that's that, like if a line disappears and then picks up somewhere else in the composition, um, the viewer is very capable of filling in that blank and, and following the path of that line. So I I really wanted to push that with something like as familiar as the human figure. Um, if pieces of that were missing, can we, can we still complete it? And I think we do. Um, and it kind of has the added bonus of um, keeping it extra, keeping this story extra open-ended, you know, um, and again, I think also like kind of having some of that um, absurdity <laughs> kind of baked into it as well. And uh, like many things, this is an idea I worked with, you know, um, a, a very long time ago, and it's something that has re-emerged in my work in recent years and in the work that I'm uh, exhibiting in this show too. Um, just another piece from that time period, I started working on canvas. You could see that the palette is starting to expand ever so slightly. I started mixing those colors with one another. Um, but I was, again, feeling a little limited by the scale. Um, all of these works were pretty small because I was using images from um, magazines. And I, and I like, felt very close to those, uh, that particular paper and like the discoloration that had happened over time and the texture of it. I was like not into the idea of photographing or um, photocopying it and enlarging yet. But um, so I was trying to kind of solve this issue of like, how do I, how do I start working larger? So um, I tried making a, you know, a slightly larger painting and what I figured out as a solution was to that these um, painted elements would become 
uh, more representative of landscapes instead of interior spaces. So I'm actually expanding the space that's being depicted in the work. And then, um, you know, that increasing the number of figures in it was also a way to kind of work through um, those scale issues. And then I could, you know, organize the scale of the images to create that perspective that I had been playing with. Um, I was also living in New York and I think being in a crowd was like a very uh, everyday experience. So I think I was also just responding to uh, my life at the time and my experience. Um, so that wasn't big enough. <laughs> I decided um, leading up to my final semester of graduate school that, um, and I, I can't exactly recall like where the idea actually came from, but I, I was doing some experiments on the walls of my studio. I remember having my um, thesis seminar class in my studio and talking about like the scale relationships of these things. And like, like I know there was a process leading to this, but um, I guess that's what happens over time. You just, <laughs> you sort of forget. Um, I, I know I sat at the bar one night with my roommate uh, talking through this idea with her and I, I remember it like really like co becoming clear to me that this was like what it was going to be and, and that's when I started planning it. So this was my um, MFA thesis exhibition. Um, it's painted and collaged directly on the wall of the gallery and um, basically it's like this battleground set up on um, this beautiful American West <laughs> slash um, kind of suburban landscape. Uh, and it's uh, these historic World War I soldiers uh, and WWF wrestlers. So um, I think all these things that I was exploring through grad school I culminated into this work um, where I could incorporate popular culture and history. I could incorporate humor and uh, nostalgia um, and probably hint at, you know, various serious undertones, but not really hit anyone over the head with it. And um, that, that has really become like a, I guess, I, for lack of a better word, like a formula for, for how I work to this day. Um, creating this accessibility through um, imagery and color, um, you know, what, kind of pointing out our nostalgia and how that works in our cultural psyche um, and also creating something that you know people will enjoy or laugh at or laugh with <laughs> um, those are things I, I really strive to achieve with every piece that I make um, so I lived in New York for five years after graduate school I was working at Pratt as an admissions counselor and um, spending a lot of time at Coney Island which is one of my uh, favorite places on earth this is an image from the hot dog eating contest, which I was lucky to attend uh, one year that I was there. Um, so I, I was thinking a lot about like recreation and um, like culturally and like how, you know, what tourism is and what it means and um, where we go as, you know, as groups of people, what, what we are attracted to. Um, and Coney Island has a, a really incredible history of, um, of being like a vacation spot. You know, it's the closest uh, public beach to the city, so it's, it's always crowded. Um, it's, it's always uh, a, a wonderful people watching experience. Um, it's, it's just one of the best places. So I depicted that in a piece later that year. This was in 2007. I was invited to exhibit this at my alma mater at Xavier University. Um, and I used a lot of my own photography combined with uh, historic images that I borrowed from books. Um, so I'd, I'd finally come around on photocopying <laughs> images. And I should note that um, all, the, all the imagery I use in these installations is designed to be, everything's designed to be temporary. So when these exhibits come down, the pieces painted over. The paper, um, especially at this point in my career, was all of these images were just paint, uh, printed on computer paper. I create stickers out of them, so I have a double-sided adhesive that I stick to the back and then 
cut out each individual image um, so that when it comes time to install it, I could just like peel the back off and stick it to the wall. Um, and that's a, a process I developed in graduate school that I still use now. And um, but you know, when it comes time to take it down, the paper is um, you know just not that strong. It often tears. It's not intended to be used again or to really exist after that. So um, making it like a fairly affordable process for me, which is which is good and certainly was good at this time, and um, and I think speaks a lot to my use of paper. Um, you know, because these pieces are temporary, um, they they sort of demand to be seen when they're there. And then, and then you, if you miss it, you don't see, it. <laughs> you know, you've, it's almost like visiting a, an amazing landscape. Like you can see pictures of the Grand Tetons your whole life, but until you're standing in front of them, um, you, you don't quite get that breathtaking experience. So, um, so I, I kind of love that like fleeting ephemerality of the work. And, um, and I think paper really embodies that. So. Um, however, I was not permitted to install this piece directly on the wall at Xavier. So you, as you can see the seams and the images, um, I um, actually had to create it on panels and to my knowledge it still exists. I think it, um, it was up in the art department there, I don't know if it still is, but um, this is one of the few, if not only, installations um, that's permanent that I've made. <laughs> Here's a detail from that. Um, I mentioned that I was working in admissions at Pratt. I traveled quite a bit for this job, so I spent a lot of time flying over um, Manhattan or, and Queens and Brooklyn, um, which is a really fantastic perspective of the city. And um, I, I came to know a few landmarks that really um, spoke to me. One of them was this, which is uh, from the 1964 World's Fair, which was held in Flushing Meadows in Queens. And, um, you know, the whole theme of the fair was um, technology, scientific advancement, space, um, and our, you know, our, our future and the technological aspects of the future. Um, this particular structure was designed by Philip Johnson. It was the New York State Pavilion. And most of the structures designed for World's Fairs are intended to be temporary. Um, but this and one other piece from that fair still stand. Um, however, this, at least in 2010, had fallen into disrepair. And um, I went there, I visited it a number of times, and. Um, being like this nostalgic person that I am, you know, I, I just sort of felt sad about it, you know, because it was so representative of this like optimistic um, and like hopeful future. And here it is kind of as like a, you know, representing like obsolete ideas, even though we've, we've achieved many of the things that we dreamed of then and more. Um, it wasn't exactly the way that we imagined it, and um, this in many ways became a monument to that for me, um, as did this structure, which um, going to JFK, I often um, flew out of the shiny new glass um, jet blue terminal that was built across the street um, that just looked like every building that was going up in New York at the time. Um, it was just like sleek and generic. Um, and across the street was this like stunning structure that um, just embodied the romanticism of flying of, you know, the middle of the 20th century. Saarinen designed the building to, to look like flight and to feel like it was taking off. Um, again, this has since been totally renovated and opened as a very chic hotel, but at the time <laughs> it was like kind of sitting sad and um, empty and dark. And, it, and again, I just had this feeling like what happened to these wonderful designs and these, um, you know, this, um, this spirit really being embodied by our physical landscape. And so I started to um, explore some of those ideas. Um, this is a small collage on paper with gouache. Um, so just sourcing images that were, um, you know, like kind of clunky or <laughs> like 
technologies that maybe didn't take off or maybe the way that um, our culture embraced some of these ideas in some fun ways. These were all kind of serving as like, you know, studies for um, this piece, which is titled Retro Future. And it was exhibited at the De Cordova um, Sculpture Park and Museum in Massachusetts. Um, and so it, it's, you know, it's kind of pulling all those ideas, all those things I was thinking um, about with those New York uh, landmarks um, into sort of this alternate future, you know? So this was exhibited in 2011. So I was thinking like, you know, some of these structures actually do exist in our landscape. Some of them did at one time and don't anymore. Many of the things and details included in here are um, from movies and television shows and never really existed in reality. Um, but it was really fun to imagine, like, had we kind of stuck with all those ideas um, that we imagined at, you know, 50 years prior, you know, what, it, what would the like alternate 2011 look like? <laughs> and would it, would it have looked anything like this? Um, a lot of back to the future influence in my <laughs> in my life as well. So this was a really fun piece and it was the initial um, use of Dayglow paint, um, which I haven't stopped using since then. So it's we're, I'm hitting nearly a decade of very intense colors in my palette. Um, I mentioned a little bit about tourism, but I've I've also um, and a little bit about like natural landscapes, but I've uh, had the opportunity to visit many of our national parks and uh, these spaces have become a big influence on my work as well. So in 2013, I visited um, Acadia National Park as well as Olympic National Park. And later that year, um, made a piece that I think, you know, I, d I don't know that I like quite knew it at the time, but was really responding to some of those um, you know, physical experiences I had in nature. Um, notably, like the feeling small in the presence of mountains or in the presence of something so much bigger than you. It's something, it's a place where I've always found solace. And, um, you know, I, I think something that I would love to in some way recreate in my work, although, you know, I can never quite do that. Um, so this piece uh, was, exhibited at the University of Toledo um, Center for Visual Arts in 2013. It's called Panorama and it's the largest piece I had made to date and it, the space really gave me a couple of great opportunities. One, um, the ceilings are quite high here. I can't remember, but they're either like 13 or 16 feet ceiling, 16 foot ceilings. And so I was really able to stretch the painting to, to really tower over the viewer. Um, and then you can't see it in this image, but there's a third wall that the piece wraps around. And up until this point, I had only made these installations on a single wall where, you, you know, as the viewer would stand in front of it and look at it as a two dimensional piece. And um, it kind of didn't occur to me until after the piece was completed that when you're, you know, getting up close to it, you're really surrounded by it. Um, and this just opened up a whole new direction for me where I was able to start thinking, considering the architecture um, as part of the work, not just like it being a painting, but that, you know, the space where it's installed in the painting having a really close relationship. Um, and I love this idea of like a person walking into the painting or being, you know, really being immersed in it in some way. So um, this was the last time I used, um, you know, some photographic collage imagery for quite a while. Um, this new idea of, of wrapping the painting around the person was kind of taking the lead as, um, as my you know, main interest. Um, around that time, I learned about dazzle camouflage. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's a um, painting and camouflage technique that was used by the uh, American and British navies in World War I. And um, merchant ships of both navies were being torpedoed like crazy. And so as a defense tactic, they um, utilized um, pretty 
simple painting techniques to um, disguise this ship. And what it did was um, disrupt the, um, the, the surfaces of the ship and make it very confusing for somebody observing this through a periscope to determine um, the speed and direction and position of these ships on the water. Um, and they're just, the images are just stunning. So Google it if you haven't looked. Um, I was also very excited to learn that women did much of this painting and they were referred to as camouflers. Um, and anyway, I, I loved that the, that what they were doing were the exact things that I was thinking about with as far as color contrasts and perspective and repetition and all, you know, all of this patterning that I had been working with in my work. Um, it was just so cool to learn that it had this amazing practical application. Um, so I got to working through some studies of optical illusions and working through um, some similar ideas where like instead of a ship, like what if I camouflaged a gallery? And so I um, uh, made this piece titled Camouflour. It's, uh, it was exhibited in Cleveland at 78th Street Studios. And I was lucky to have several weeks to spend in the space creating it. Um, it was the first time I painted like a floor and I, I really wanted to like create this space that you could observe from one side of the gallery like this image shows, um, but also walk through it and discover um, the objects and the, like the optical illusion as well um, from different points of view or vantage points within the gallery. Um, I documented my process. If you can see me in there, I dressed as a camouflage, as a painter um, in, in my uniform every day and um, really just had so much fun making this. Um, it was a new direction for me, which I um, continued in uh, this piece, which was is titled Depthless Without You. It was exhibited at the Akron Art Museum in 2015 as part of a group show called Neo Geo. And so just um, combining more patterning, including objects that are also painted to either sink back into um, you know, the flat surfaces, depending on where you stand in the gallery, um, and then you know, sort of emerge as dimensional in other spaces. So I had a wonderful experience making this piece, an uh, awesome team of preparators at the museum who helped me um, get this done in like a record time. And um, this has just always been one of my favorite, favorite projects. Um, anyway, I repurposed some elements from that exhibition um, for this piece. And I, I worked with a couple, um, you know, smaller installation pieces after that, um, where I had, when I had been using the collage, like photographs, um, I had the ability to like prep a, a flat surface and then collage that, that two dimensional image on and it would provide this illusion of, of depth. Um, now, since I was like kind of replacing that with objects, I could reverse that process and use something that's obviously dimensional, but arrange it in such a way that it flattened into two dimensions. So, um, so that was a fun experiment, something I worked with in this piece, which is untitled. And this piece called Multiverse, which was exhibited at the University of Dayton a few years ago with Susan, who's in this show as well. So <laughs> a couple times we've exhibited together. Um, I visited quite a few more national parks in 2015. And um, of those experiences was just completely floored by South Dakota. I did not, um, I, like I knew about what I was gonna see there, but I wasn't in any way prepared for um, exactly what it was. And, um, and so this was a part of the country that just uh, really captured my heart. Um, 
and also I visited some caves there, which I hadn't done before. These are images from Wind Cave National Park and Jewel Cave. And um, something that really struck me about caves is that, you know, you could be entering through a really cramped space or moving through, um, you know, some really tight, dark areas. And then suddenly you're like in a really massive room that you just didn't expect. And um, that was a completely new experience for me when I was there. And one that um, came back when I was given the opportunity to um, make this piece, which is at Case Western Reserve's um, University Center. So the building was fairly new um, when I did this project. And if you look at it from across the street, it's um, it's pretty low profile. It has like a really elegant relationship to the landscape. Um, but once you're inside, it's like so much bigger than it seems. Um, and I just immediately thought of that that experience of being in the cave, um, you know, in this built environment. Um, the in front of this wall is a grand staircase um, that has like a little nook carved underneath it for a study space. Um, and I, it, I just felt like it was, it was cave-like in so many ways. So I kind of recreated the stalactites um, in this geometric pattern um, for this piece called Cavern. I've also had the opportunity to do um, some really great public art projects. This is the most recent um, piece completed in 2018. It's in Toledo, Ohio at Prometica headquarters. It's called the Dazzle Colonnade. And it's, um, a, it's installed along a walkway that um, accesses the elevators and the exit on the lower level of the parking garage. And so um, this, this view is a little unfair because you don't, wouldn't normally see it uh, this way. If you were using the space, cars would be parked in front of it. Uh, it really was designed um, for someone to be like experiencing it as they walk along it. Um, so here's another view of it, and then it continues on to the exterior of the structure as well. Um, just as the last part of my talk, I'll talk a little bit about some more recent um, explorations I've been doing in my work, and then um, we can we can discuss the work in this show or whatever questions everyone has. Um, after the, um, the Toledo Public Art Project, I was getting a little fatigued with some of the um, like dazzle patterning I was doing and those hard um, geometric patterns. I wanted, I really like wanted the work to loosen up in some way, maybe soften, um, maybe um, take on a more textural quality. So I started exploring a lot of those things um, with some different experiments. And one of the things I did was take um, two Paper, paintings on paper that I had exhibited and um, began folding them and manipulating them, which is another thing I really love about paper is there's, um, you know, it's sort of non-precious as far as an art material and expense goes. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's easy to cut and manipulate and fold and, um, and I, I really love kind of all these different things that I can do with it. Um, so I took two of these paintings and folded them and attempted some origami and um, arranged them and rearranged them in my studio and took a number of images of, or photos of them. Those photos have, had become sketches that I've used for a number of pieces since then. So the, what they were were two paintings with just diagonal stripes on them. But when they were folded, these lines became jagged and swirling and um, cut off and, and so forth. And um, it's really amazing that those, you know, those, those sketches have translated once I've applied color and increased scale with them um, to some really um, or like uh, forms that reference organic things. Um, this piece was created in Tucson at the Museum of Contemporary Art last year. And when I enlarged these um, images to this scale and, and then applied the color, I, you know, I couldn't get over like the geological reference that was happening, um, waveforms, 
um, even like a sunrise um, and reflections on clouds. Um, it just emerged from the work and I didn't, I didn't totally expect it. And so um, I've, I've really found some joy in, in using those sketches and, and creating some new work with them um, over the last year and a half or so. Um, so. A few more images from that. It was a, I painted the entire gallery and then installed these like found objects that I also painted um, referencing our natural and built environments. And so really just thinking about how, um, you know, how a city or uh, an urban space might um, contrast against a beautiful sunset or, you know, like how our worlds, um, especially in a place like Tucson where you have like this amazing um, natural expanse surrounding the city, you know, how both of those places um, come together. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned before, um, old ideas never really go away. I think they go dormant for a while and then come back. So I've also, in the last couple of years, been working a lot, uh, once again, with these um, truncated figures and limbs and hands. Um, this time, you know, exploring a relationship to the newer painted um, palettes and patterns I've been working with. Um, you know, just thinking about how those images can be situated within the painting or if the painting can kind of take the place of a, of a body, for instance. Um, and so these two images will look familiar because I've repurposed the collage um, portion of them in my work in this show. Um, these were two very small five by seven paintings that I made a couple years ago. Um, but it's it's interesting to for this hand, for instance, when it's um, embedded within this work, it it feels like it plays a role in it, like it's gonna pluck this little form out of the painting, and it feels gentle. Um, whereas in the context of this piece, which is one that I'm exhibiting um, in paper routes, it's um, it's standing on its own. It's a little more independent of the painting and suddenly feels like it's controlling it in a way. And so um, that, was, uh, that was a really interesting shift um, where I was really thinking about, um, you know, these hands like holding up paintings or like performing an action on them um, before a conversation with a friend. Um, and she pointed out that she felt that, you know, maybe, maybe these hands were really doing something to the painting. So um, it was a really wonderful remark. And, one that um, that got me thinking um, about you know the um, the image itself, whose hand is it, and uh, what is it attached to? Because we don't know, um, or who is it attached to, and uh, what does it have the power to do? And so um, I began thinking about those questions a lot more. Um, this piece is titled "Lift," and um, in the context of this show, I. I'm really referencing the idea of that word um, being used by women, um, lifting one another up. Um, and this is not a female hand. It's <laughs> maybe a suggestion to the owner of this hand to also be, to also lift, um, to, to also um, participate in that. Um, and if we look, um, back to, well, I don't think I could quite flip back to it, but the, um, the piece I created <laughs> on this side of, um, of the wall as I, that I started with, um, this mantle, I, um, this is the only piece that I exhibited in the show that I made um, after May 25th. And um, it was the one work that was started and not, not quite resolved yet. And the events of 2020 uh, certainly had an influence and an impact on uh, the way I approached the piece and, and what I wanted to say. So um, I'll leave it there. Thank you all very much and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thanks a lot. Hey, I do have a few questions. Okay. Kind of picking up where you start off. I'm going to read this because these are cat stories and I want to give cat very credit for her really thoughtful questions. 
right? Much of your work is seeing a reflection or manipulation of patterns in the history. The current state of the world has extremely studio practice conditioning were affected. So in what ways? Yeah. Um, you know, I think that's a really great question because I um, I certainly felt it happening, but with um, with any experience that has influenced my work in the past, it um, it tends to take a take a minute. Um, for instance, like I talked about this experience in the cave, um, like a year and a half passed between like having that physical experience and creating that piece, and I think that um, you know that. Um, I guess gestation period. Like I, I just have to like let those things sink in, and um, I don't always have a real control over it. It's not like I go back in my mind or in my experience and like pick a thing out and say like that's what I'm gonna make now. You know, <laughs> like it's um, usually happens pretty organically. Like I set foot in that building, and you know, I just like recalled that experience immediately, and that's what it was gonna be. Um, this obviously um, our experience this year. I, you know, I can't compare any other time in my life to it. Um, but I was, I was very surprised that I had, um, I had something to say as quickly as I did. Um, over the summer, I um, transitioned to a new city, into a new studio. Um, so there was a lot of time where I was like mentally working on this piece before I was settled into my new studio and was able to really physically work on it. Um, and uh, I think like many of us, I was um, having a lot of conversations. I was reading a lot. I was, um, you know, participating on social media in ways that were both healthy and maybe not the most healthy and just, Kind of working through some of these really difficult things and um i think you know i i think a lot of that quiet work um emerged once i finally got into the studio and was able to finish this piece so um yeah it surprised me but it um usually takes me more time to process but um but here we are <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's like um, this sort of obvious conver like, uh, contrast for me between something that's intuitive and something that's really process driven and easy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so in the beginning, you started talking about the constraints that you put on yourself um, collage. Mm -hmm. How have those constraints like, changed or shifted? Do you still? Do you still put limits on your work? Um, and if so, in what way is there? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, I you use the word constraints, and I, one word that I that has hung with me since a, one of my critiques I had uh, in graduate school was from a professor who was um, like applauding a painting I had made. But one thing that she really liked about it is where I had showed restraint with it. She used the word restraint, and that's, um, and I, I took it as such a compliment because it was, she, she kind of hit the nail on the head with this particular conversation where um, I had like knowingly like stopped myself in this particular work, and she somehow looked at it and recognized that. And so um, that, I mean, just her um, observation of that, I think surprised me a little bit, but also kind of pointed out the importance of like, when, you know, of course the question is always like, when do you stop? Or like, when is it done? Or, um, you know, when is too much too much? When is less more? Um, but I do, I really like keep that restraint advice in my back pocket, you know? Um, there's, um, there, there were several times in making this piece that I just felt like it wasn't done, like there was something it was missing, or um, it needed one more thing to happen in it. And then um, once I got here and I created it, and I kind of messed around with the 
the paper painting and like how it was folding and like finally arrived at a solution with it. I was like, I was really happy with its simplicity. So, um, you know, as you saw in a lot of my work in this presentation, like more is more is to, like has often been my, <laughs> my mantra. Um, so it, it has been nice to create some simpler pieces and just kind of pare down, um, you know, what the message is at times too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, my next question, I think, is a combo question between Pat and myself. So she pointed out that agency seems to be a through line in your work. Um, and I wonder if that is at all related to uh, your color story or the way mm. that you choose um, color and why. I, just, I really love the color work so much. Um, Thank you. And I just want to know more about that. Um, the question was, um, the, the agency has been recognized as a, a through line in my work, and is that in any way um, related to my color palettes or color choices? Um, wow, that's really wonderful. I hadn't, I guess I didn't think of it that way, but I, I mean, I like that interpretation. Um, color is... You know, I always, when people ask about my color choices, I, I think I always give the answer that nobody wants to hear. And that's that like, it's, it's very intuitive. <laughs> it's like not, it's like a non-answer. Um, it's, it is certainly backed up by like years of practice and um, careful study of color theory and, and all that good stuff. But, um, you know, when it comes down to it, I'm not picking a palette before I sit down to paint. Um, I, I really love the process of, of sitting with a, a painting and trial and error. Just and, and one thing I always do is try to mix or select a color that sh absolutely should not make any sense in this context and, and then try to make it work. So I, I'm always creating a problem for myself and then trying to solve it. Um, with color. And so I think, yes, in that sense, like, I guess you could describe like that as this sense of agency with it, where like, let me try and break all the rules and then make them work. Or, um, um, and in a lot of cases, just like using paint out of the tube, which is like the thing that you, as a student, you're like never supposed to do. And I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna do this, you know? <laughs> Which happens, you know, with day glow, of course, there's no mixing, like you, you just use it right out of the can and um, it's, it is what it is, you know, and, and those colors can be really, really challenging to, um, to use effectively. And I think that's why I'm still using them after all these years, like I just want to always find ways to make them work um, in the not so obvious like black light context, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think a lot of artists you talk to would probably agree with that on some level. <laughs> Great. Oh, great questions. Um, what's next for me? I, um, have a show that's uh, sort of actual dates yet to be nailed down, but next spring in Toledo at River House. So I'm very excited um, to develop um, some new work for that space. It's a really interesting and um, beautiful space that provides some like very cool challenges. So, um, so I'm looking forward to that new project. Um, also just setting up my new studio, which is giant and beautiful. So <laughs> that's the big project right now. Um, and then uh, female artists I'm excited about. Um, Wendy White has been uh, just like my girl crush for a while. Her, um, her work she's been making over the last few years is just like so constantly exciting to me. 
um, and she has a really wonderful voice online and um, I just, you know, I love what she makes and what she stands for and um, there's, I think, some maybe overlap in our sensibilities, but, um, but mostly I just have such a huge respect for her. Um, and then I have a really wonderful um, group of artists who I've become very close with and who I work with um, in Toledo and they've, they've been my, um, you know, my other girl crushes, <laughs> um, over the last few years, the people who've really, um, kept, you know, kept me going, especially, you know, as a painter, you have such an isolated practice at times. So to have a community of women, um, backing you up has been really wonderful. So Jordan Busher, um, who I think maybe in a show here next year, um, and Lindsay Akins and a number of other really wonderful artists in Toledo. Those are, they're like, they're my favorites. <laughs> Do I need to? Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Well, one thing I wanted to point out about this piece and you know the experience of seeing the show virtually, um, I may have um, mentioned this at the beginning, but like was at some point in my presentation, but like with any artwork, of course, I think we've grown a lot more accustomed to experiencing art. Um, on our screen, pre pandemic. And, um, you know, it's, it's been really wonderful for a lot of reasons. Like, I have so much more access to many contemporary artists that like, we didn't really have access to prior to social media, for instance. But, um, you know, I think it, it makes it also very easy to, like, not necessarily go to a show when it's up. And of course, right now we can't do that. But, um, but I don't know, just as like, a, public service announcement, like go, go to the shows, like go see the work because um, something like this, like photographs well, it, you know, it's gonna look great, but like there's a real physicality and scale relationship to a human's body um, and um, like a palette that just will never uh, translate in like through photography ever. So this red, although it might look pretty bright for your screen right now, um, is like so intense. <laughs> Super, like in the context of this piece, might describe it as toxic. And um, that's something you, you, just, you just miss, you know, especially if your phone is like a big grandma or whatever, you're just not gonna see the color. And um, for most painters and, and artists, that's hugely important for you to experience that with your with your body and with your eyeballs. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm I'm glad you're actually getting these shots because you can really see the scale relationship as the viewer is standing with it. So, <laughs> um, and then there's three small uh, collages on paper with gouache that are exhibited uh, with these pieces as well. So. Um, yeah, getting back to these like dismembered limbs and um, connecting in some way with this painted. I always see these patterns. Um, so, you know, whether they're like these giant hands kind of manipulating the space or the landscape or, um, uh, or just shapes interacting with color. Um, they're, they're just fun studies in the experiment. Um, this, this is a, the fifth uh, titled Body Slash Image, one and two. So I, I had showed an image in my presentation where I used um, the same arms. Um, and kind of 
it, you know, took the, removed the body and replaced it with painting. So um, that's really what these are about, you know, is um, what is the, the physicality of the painting? Who, who is the painting? <laughs> um, you know, can, can the owner of these hands and arms, you know, be replaced by what's there? Um, just a fun figure ground exercise. <laughs> and then, yeah, I'm glad you're filming this too, because I think the images I have of this piece are kind of straight on, but um, you can see the dimension of it as you move through the space, but it's just a folded piece of paper, really. Um, and I, and I, hadn't, I hadn't really worked um, it on an installation that like, wasn't painted directly on the wall. Um, it was fun to have a painting on paper and then manipulate it um, to interact with the space and the collage. So quite happy with how this piece came out. I started this idea, um, I was at a residency in Yaddo, at Yaddo last fall. And so this, um, I was working with a friend of mine who was using large, um, Amy Ritter, she actually went to school in Columbus, um, lived here for a while. But she was she uses like large Xeroxes in her work, and um, you know we were talking, and I was like maybe like maybe I should try that again. Like I used big images a while ago. It's been a minute, so we ordered all these images, and I I just had these in the studio there, and really happy to have resolved this piece from that experience. Thank you, Natalie, for coming out and yeah, working through this artist project. <laughs> and, um, it's really special, and I learned a lot, and I'm hoping that everyone gets as much out of this as they absolutely can. Um, we would like to remind you that on the 27th of this month, Susan Lee O'Connor is doing her artist demo. Um, that is also scheduled to be Facebook Live. Stay tuned. Um, and I would just like to close by thanking the Ohio Arts Council, the Ohio Advisory Group to the National Museum of Women and Arts, and our legislature in this great state and this great state. Thank you. Thank you so much.